sister, English literature, I call her for help to edit my book. This is the first time any of them have called me to help for quantum physics. So as Mike said, uh, uh, well, you know, Mike, you might think this is some sort of scam where he invites me to give a talk so I can attend the family reunion <laughs> and my nephew's wedding on, on the weekend, okay? And, and he, you, most of the time you would be right, but in this case, no. I actually, huh? goes the other way. I did write the first, uh, uh, I literally wrote the first large review article with Jared Milburn on quantum technologies 2003. Where's Christine? Christine, Christine. My niece was three years old. She now has graduated from high school, okay? So that tells you we were predicting this long ago and I was told it was basically nuts. This was too crazy, okay? And Bill Phillips, who you just saw in Tommaso's talk, Nobel Prize, 10 years ago, if you asked him when the quantum computer would be ready, he would say, and I realize people can't see me over there. No, but, there's uh, things here. Oh, there's things there, okay. So uh, he said, it's a 50-50 chance. And I said, what does that mean, Bill? He goes, 50% chance we'll have one in 50 years or never, okay? But now we hear 10 years, okay? 10 years is starting to get scary, okay? It's promising and scary, all right? So, it, it, I, this is an old slide. I think the European bubble is, is now, what it's, what's the rate, 100 million euros in a minute or something in <laughs> Europe, okay? I think the China bubble is that, in the US, it's maybe $10 a minute, I think it's the current rate. Uh, ho however, just last week, uh, the uh, department, uh, is the committee, the Senate Committee for Science and Technology, just proposed that we should start a, a new international initiative, a national initiative, for quantum technologies, but they didn't put any money in it. And the same guy who runs this doesn't believe in global warming, so I'm not hopeful. <laughs> but anyway, so this is uh, just an overview of you know what's going on from I'm crazy, okay, to it's uh, taking off. And here are some more things. This is exploring activity. It, I thought this. I got this from Bloomberg News, okay, which many of the business people might know, almost as good as Forbes, I suppose, but. They interviewed me and they wanted, they were doing an article on patents and quantum technology. And I said, well, what, what's happened? And they go, well, let me send you some slides, okay? Since the US is blue, China is red, Japan is gray, and everybody else is in the north, okay? So this is, uh, so Europe is, 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 just, is out here somewhere, okay? But notice something happened in 2013 and 14. It went from Linear to exponential growth. I don't know what. Google got into the game with Martinez to do the superconducting quantum computers. We think it might be that. But something clearly has changed in terms of the business profile. And we just saw this, and I'm going to try to answer this question in my talk. Notice the quantum internet on Tommaso's slide comes before the computer. Why would you build an internet to connect the computers together if you haven't built the computers yet? Okay, so. There are other things that we want to connect, sensors, clocks, and many things. Now, it is true that uh, Professor Riga gave such a great talk. I should ditch my slide on the your cat, but since this all is new stuff to many of you, coming quickly, I'm going to do it my own way, okay? It's good to hear this a couple of times. And the clicker, ah. So I did my PhD in the foundations of quantum mechanics, so, uh, 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 a little bit after Alain Espe we heard about. And I was also told by a professor on my PhD committee, this was crackpot stuff and I would never get a job. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I worked actually here at Munich as a postdoctoral intern at the Max Planck Institute in dark and quantum optics. Then I went to work for the US government for, from uh, 1990 to 19, uh, 2004. I was part of the program that developed the U.S. Department of Defense and Intelligence Agency program. In those days, it was mostly funded by the DOD and the spies. Okay. Now, industry is really taking off. However, this is where I was. And in 1994, something miraculous happened. This guy named Shore came up with an algorithm 
If it ran on a quantum computer, it could hack public key RSA encryption. And everybody just went nuts, okay? So, and that was the beginning of quantum computing. I organized the first uh, Department of Defense workshop on quantum computing and cryptography in 1995. And before 1994, if you went to a meeting on foundations of quantum mechanics, there were the ratio of crackpots to sane people was about one to one. <laughs> And, uh, and it was held in the Motel One near the Munich airport. Okay? <laughs> After 1994, we were at a resort on the Isle of Capri with NSA guys sitting in the front row paying for everything. So, <laughs> so somehow, this became a really hot area that I've gotten a PhD in. And I emailed Professor Mahamdaba back at the University of Colorado. I wrote, Mahamdaba, I got a job. Dowling, he's the one I said I'd never get a job, right? He, he's a string theorist. Okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about not getting a job. Okay, so I'm gonna whiz through some of this stuff. Uh, 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 certainly, uh, Yosef's uh, presentation was very good. But this is where we start. And this ties into Damaso's point. The basic research, where's Damaso, you disappeared. I'm trying to be as funny as Joseph and talk faster than Tomasa. <laughs> I might explode. Okay. So the foundations of quantum, this is the basic stuff that people who weren't going to get jobs were working on anyway. And out of this came all of the technology. So, you, you know, people say, oh, you shouldn't fund basic research. And this is like 70, more, 100 years out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. So we have to have the cat back. Okay, there's the poor cat. We already heard this it's prussic acid, which I think is a side eye based thing. In one minute, is it an hour or a minute, Joseph, in your uh, one hour. One hour. Okay, one hour, you open the box, and the cat is either dead or alive, okay, with the 50-50 probability. Before you open the box, it's debatable what is in the box. Some people say the cat is dead and alive. Uh, I like to say the cat is neither dead nor alive. It could actually be in a superposition of half dead and half alive. Okay, so there are many options. However, when you open the box, you see this, this dead cat. Okay, or the live cat, 50 50 probability. But there's another point that this is triggered by an atomic decay process, which is also quantum over here. So you could do a different experiment. You open this part of the box. If the atom has decayed, without looking here, you know the cat is dead, the machine has functioned. If the atom has not decayed, you measure the atom. Well, if the atom has not decayed, you're sure the cat is still alive, okay? So measuring the atom collapses the cat. <laughs> and you guys laugh, okay? This is reality. Okay? I gave a talk in Washington, D.C. at an undisclosed location uh, near Langley, Virginia. Okay? And they started laughing. And then I put some of the Professor uh, Pang slides up, and they stopped laughing immediately. <laughs> Professor Pang will be speaking next from the Chinese program. So anyway. So that's, and as, said, as we heard from uh, uh, Professor Reagan, and this is independent of distance. So I could put this atom on Alpha Centauri and the cat on Beta Pictoris, okay, 62 light years away. And the theory says if I measure this to uh, be uh, decay, the cat will instantaneously die 62 light years away. You have to accept that. That's reality. Okay? And we can't do experiments with cats because the people for ethical treatment of animals don't like this, okay? But here are the three weird things from the Schrodinger paper. And, and actually, this is in my book. He mistranslated it. Where's where Joseph? So, for Schrant, okay, I think this is not the correct word. So, this is for Schrant, right? For Schrant. Yeah, yeah. But entangled is something like the cat playing with a very disordered. So I, it should have been entwined. So I think Schrodinger mistranslated his own paper. So if you look up <laughs> entanglement, it says like a ball of uh, a wire or something, and that special usage, physics, going back in the German, is this physics thing. You're welcome to argue with him, John. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. He's dead. I, I know. <laughs> and I'm alive. <laughs> but it was a wonderful thought. I was told not to pick on him. <laughs> okay, so anyway, here are the three things that Schrodinger laid out in his paper that were strange, and he was basically attacking quantum mechanics. But the entanglement is the big thing. You measure the atom on Alpha Centauri, and you kill the cat on Beta Victoris instantaneously. Nobody liked that, okay? Uh, before the cat 
is measured, or the atom is measured, it's neither dead nor alive. It's unreal. It doesn't actually have a, a state. Uh, the way I like to say this is, uh, I say to Christine, where's Christine? I say, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to ask Christine, is your cat dead or alive? Because she doesn't own a cat. <laughs> okay? So it's a question that has no real answer. Okay? But we calculate things so we can compute. And it comes out 50-50. Now, when you flip a coin, okay, and it lands head or tails, 50-50. Okay? If I knew all of the exact motion that I threw the coin into the air, the wind velocity, friction, everything, I could actually calculate which way it would land. Not in quantum mechanics. When you make a measurement, you get 50% dead or 50% alive. It is completely unpredictable. That's part of quantum mechanics. This is the uncertainty. So we have non-locality, unreality, and uncertainty. Now, who did not like that? Einstein. So he wrote a paper. It's actually came out before the Schrodinger paper. Uh, Einstein attacks quantum theory. Nathan Rosen, uh, uh, no, Podolsky leaked this to the New York Times uh, several weeks before publication, and his, his job at the Institute for Advanced Studies was not renewed. But uh, in any case, Einstein uh, suggested an alternative theory, something like a statistical theory that would replace quantum mechanics and not have all of these weird, strange properties, okay? So, but this was just sort of to be, thought to be a, a, a philosophical argument. Well, there's the Einstein approach, and then there's the quantum mechanics, and do either one. No. In 1965, so we're 35 to 65, that's how long it took to figure this out. Bell proved that the Einstein theory gives a different prediction in the lab than quantum mechanics. They are not two philosophies. They are two different physical theories that can be tested. It's no longer people arguing over cigars in a dark room with wine, what's the correct interpretation? They are two different theories. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the lab and see which one is right. The crazy cat, unreal, non-local uh, uncertainty, or Einstein's local realistic theory. And mm -hmm. the issue was, and the clicker thumped up. Ah. So I put Aspey here. Actually, Clouser did the first experiment at the University of Berkeley, and then he went on to Lawrence Livermore, and Aspey asked the Berkeley Physics Department if he could borrow Clouser's equipment. Now, this is an interesting story. Uh, without citing Clouser, Clouser was not very happy. Clouser did the first experiment, 78, and this was 82, and they showed that this, uh, uh, they ruled out the Einstein theory versus quantum mechanical theory to several significant digits. And you see here, instead of cats, these are horizontal and vertically polarized photons because we're not allowed to use cats. So you can send these entangled photons. This was over a distance of maybe 10 meters in this lab in Paris, 13 meters there. And the idea is that if you have an atom that decays, it either shoots a V or an H, or H and a B, but you don't know which, so you get an entanglement of HD plus DH, just like cat dead, cat alive, atom decayed, atom not decayed, same thing. All right, so this showed quantum mechanics was true, and Einstein's alternative theory was wrong in the lab, so don't argue about this anymore. Well, maybe, you know, if you test it over longer distances, I can give you all the experiments, but Professor Peng will talk next, and it's gone from 10 meters to 1,200 kilometers. This Einstein is ruled out over these distances, and at, at the 99.9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
And so that is RSA encryption, public key encryption, is all based on that idea. It's actually not even proven to be hard classically, but it's proven to be easy quantum mechanically. So if you go the other way, this is very hard. Okay. So that's the basis of public key encryption. And I should mention that one of the things on your slide with the Daniel Lidar, it's a block, blockchain is dead. Well, that's actually true. Blockchain uses public key encryption. So if we have a universal quantum computer in 10 years, Bitcoin, first person to have it, gets all the Bitcoins. And anything else that's on the blockchain, the blockchain is dead in 10 years. That's, that's, you should think about that and laugh. Huh? Okay. So, no, here's, there's actually an interesting movie you might want to watch with Robert Redford, where they find a classical factoring algorithm, high speed, and program it into a telephone answering machine, and then they have to fight with the NSA and some Russian bad guys to get it back. But, and he says, we can tell you what it's about, but then we'll have to kill you. Okay. <laughs> but this was actually based on a classical high-speed factoring algorithm with the plot of this a thriller movie, so it's quite interesting. But in 1994, Shor showed that if you had a quantum computer, and we heard my numbers are a little smaller because my slides are older, so the classical computers have gotten better, and he also has up-to-date numbers. But still, if a quantum computer could hack these things in a couple of seconds. How does it work? I'm going to give you the, the line I like, which everybody else hates. So in the old-fashioned cars, you have these odometers, right? You, you buy the new car, BMW 0000. This one spins one, two, three, it gets to nine, and then it goes to zero, but you get ten, right? Okay. And those are, some of you are old enough to remember they were wheels, okay? <laughs> so there's a million numbers that it can show, but it only shows one at a time, okay? So the quantum odometer actually is processing all million numbers simultaneously. So it's like parallel processing in parallel universes. Because these are not all in our universe, they're in some place called Hilbert space. So the trick is, as Joseph mentioned, is that if you make a measurement incorrectly, it just collapses and you get the, the right probability with an exponentially small uh, chance. So the idea is to steer the probability of getting the correct answer out of all of the other universes that we don't live in into our universe. So when you measure, you're very likely to get the correct result. And again, that sounds like I'm, I'm a complete madman. <laughs> but this is an actual fair description of what's going on. And only certain problems have this ability. So that people say, well, the quantum computers will give an exponential speed up on everything. Not every problem has this ability to steer the answer back into our universe. Factoring happens to luckily be one of them. All right, so super good that we saw, uh, uh, actually this is supposed to be ion traps and uh, typo. Semiconductor we saw, optical, there are several uh, startup companies, Jeremy O'Brien has one, you may have heard his name, doing optical uh, quantum computing. There's another company in Toronto doing called Xanadu. They have the dark horse because if they actually build a quantum computer all optically, it immediately can be fit into the quantum internet because it's photons can talk to photons. It's hard to get superconductors to talk to photons. All right, so we'd like to hook the quantum computers over some internet. This is a scary or exciting slide. So this is superconducting qubits as a function of uh, the quarters, okay? Doubling time of the number of qubits is every six months. I call it S'mores law. It's more as like a chocolate treat with marshmallows, okay? So, but you have to remember, as Joseph taught us, that the processing power goes like two to the n. So this is doubling in number of qubits, but the processing power is doubling, doubling in the number of qubits. So we have a hyper exponential scaling in the processing power. So if this keeps up, I mean, this is where 10 years is coming from. All right, quantum cryptography. So you sell the government a quantum computer and say, oh my God, if we have a quantum computer, and uh, we'll hack the internet in 10 years. And then they go, well, what should we do? Then we sell them another quantum thing that fixes it, okay? And we, this, is, this is how you get 100 million euros a minute or whatever. Okay? Quantum cryptography is immune from attack, okay, from a quantum computer. So this is a secret code invented by an army telegraph officer during the Civil War. It's also called the one-time pad. It was proven unbreakable by any means by Claude Shannon in the 1940s. It's unbreakable by even a quantum computer. So this is the response to the quantum computer. And we'll hear in the next talk how uh, the Chinese program has basically put this in place all over China and in space. The pads actually used to look like this. They would be in a diplomatic pouch. You would carry them. You would take your letters of your message and transcribe them on a translucent piece of paper to random characters. 
And then the other person on the other end has the same pad and transcribes them back. And as long as the characters are random and you never reuse the pad, and nobody makes a copy of the pad that you're unaware of, then it's provably secure. Okay? The problem is people can always make a copy. And you might not know. The guy in the first class with the thing changed to his wrist might get drugged by a spy and they make a copy of the copy. So in quantum uh, uh, information, we always have three players. There's Alice. <laughs> anybody know who's this? Yeah. <laughs> Eve. And then the fashion designer, Eve, saying, well, I'm okay. Anybody know who this is? We have any English people? Colin? No, he's on the plane. This is at Bob from an English uh, uh, comedy called Black Adder. Why she her name was Bob, I don't know. But the point is, the eavesdropper could always make a copy of the pad. He'd stick it into the Xerox machine, drug the courier, stick it back into the bag, lock it back up, and he would never know, and then he could read everything. Oops. What key? No. Okay. Ah! What do they do? You hit the black key. Press it again. Press it again. Ah, okay. Oh, perfect. The point is, because of quantum uncertainty, quantum unreality, and entanglement, you cannot copy a quantum pad. Because if you try to make a copy of a single photon carrying a bit of information, you destroy the quantum state. It collapses the dead or alive, or half dead and half alive. And it basically, one, destroys the pad, so there's nobody gets a pad, and two, reveals the presence of the eavesdropper. So if you switch to quantum cryptography, you can distribute it without any chance of copying it. There's something called the no cloning theorem. You cannot copy a quantum state, okay? If you try to, Heisenberg's inserted principle says you disrupt it, and, it, and uh, that's the point. So you switch to photons. The whole point about transmitting the pad securely is taken care of, and you run this often enough so that they don't duplicate the pad, and we're gonna see this in the next talk, one of the, this is reality. This is runs between uh, Beijing and Shanghai, and also on their satellite. We heard about the Austrian uh, uh, Beijing telecommunication earlier. So this is over a distance of what six thousand kilometers. Yeah. Okay. This is reality. Okay. So uh, quantum sensing and imaging. We heard that briefly mentioned. So this is this is stuff. Before the quantum computer comes online, we want to get together into the internet. Okay, that's why we have other things besides computers. So Colin was a co-author on this paper with me. We this made it, uh, uh, we showed quantum entanglement could be used to uh, uh, beat the diffraction limit in lithography. So what does that mean? When you make an Intel chip, you use lith optical lithography, and they keep going from blue to UV to, to, to X-ray and so forth. So the idea of this is that I take 10 red photons, entangle them, and it acts like a single X-ray photon. So I don't have to change the optics and invest billions of dollars. I just use entangled photons to do this. Now, it never worked out for lithography. Intel uh, came in, uh, we gave a presentation, and then they said, don't call us, we'll call you. That was what it, <laughs> it does work for other things, OK? Places where you might think the diffraction limit comes in, microscopy and sensing. So this is a, this is a, a quantum microscope using this technique. And uh, I love this one. They're now using entangled photons in the giant gravity wave detector, LIGO, that detected black holes and confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity for prediction of gravity waves. So this is now being put into, this is the LIGO interferometer by my university. We, we helped run this thing. And they're now putting squeezed light, which is essentially an entangled form of light, into the thing to uh, improve the sensitivity of the interferometer. So they're using entanglement, which Einstein hated, to improve the device <coughs> that searches for the black holes and gravity waves that he predicted. <coughs> so he would not be very happy. <laughs> All right, and you could make the gyroscopes, uh, uh, lots of other things, gravity sensors, magnetometers, synchronized clocks, all of these different things. So we have imagers and sensors, and we would like to link them together. In fact, if you have a bunch of clocks and the clocks are entangled, you actually, if you have, uh, let's say, 10, 100 clocks, and you average their signal, the improvement that you get is a factor of 10, the square root of 100. However, if you have 100 entangled clocks and you average them, the improvement you get is 100 in signal to noise, not, not 10. So you, you get around this uh, Poisson and noise thing. I keep hitting the wrong button. There we go. So this is the UK sensor roadmap, okay? UK client imaging roadmap. 
And so let's go to the bottom internet. So the idea is to take all of these things that came out of here and put them into an internet. Okay, how are we gonna do that? So I was asked to talk about the American program. Uh, we don't really have one. So it was mentioned that there was, a, that Dr. Kretschmar mentioned that there was a the DARPA program. It was in 2003, it was killed off by 2008. So, and we also had a plan to launch an encryption satellite in, in 2009. It was killed off by the intelligence agencies nine months before launch. So we might have been tied or ahead of the Chinese, except we had one, one program manager said, I don't want to fund this quantum ship. Okay, and that was it. Okay, so this is from the White House, as you can see, it's got you know missiles, and uh, this is the American dream of the quantum internet. But the idea is that you have uh, sensors, quantum computers, uh, imagers, clocks, all linked together with the quantum internet, and the quantum internet provides this advantage of a signal to noise if you connect the sensors in an entangled way, and it also provides the security through the encryption. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, one of the key things we heard briefly about is teleportation. And you're supposed to never think about Star Trek, but it's kind of like Star Trek. It's, in Star Trek, Captain Kirk is sitting here. What's my time? Good. Yeah. Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Oh, okay, I'm almost done. So in Star Trek, uh, Captain Kirk disappears here, right, and then he reappears in outer space. Okay, that's Star Trek. And that's, we're not going to do that with a human being because that requires extra paperwork. What we're going to do with a single photon, okay? <laughs> Particularly, he's going to do it with a single photon. Okay, so the way it works is a lot like Star Trek. You have a photon with a quantum state. Now, what is interesting about this, and we, from Joseph's talk, we know an arbitrary quantum state, it can take a, an infinite number of bits to describe that state of arbitrary precision. So this could have maybe thousands of bits of information in it, if I trunk it, okay? So I had an entangled photon pair, not with cats, but with polarized photons. And I make a measurement here that destroys the quantum state instantaneously. The quantum state with the thousands of digits appears here, possibly a thousand kilometers away. Okay. Now you can't use this to send signals faster than the speed of light. You have to send two bits of classical information from this measurement in order to reconstruct the state, B has to perform one, op one of four operations. If he does not do that, then you get random noise. But think about this. I'm sending thousands of bits of information quantumly, and I only need two bits to confirm the scheme. So I don't have to do much of anything. And if this is, uh, these two bits are in the classical channel, I can send them by cell phone. If I wanted to teleport to the BMW building, which is where? Right that way, okay. I could go to the roof after the teleportation started and send smoke signals or, or hand signals. This is bit one and this is whatever, there's just two bits, okay? And that completes the teleportation. And I gave, when I gave this talk last week in DC, they started laughing. They don't laugh when they see this. So this is, again, the Chinese program, a thousand kilometers teleported photon into space, okay? Teleportation is key, so why? So this is stuff that we're working on. Now, by, by now, many of you are thinking, gosh, this is quantum stuff, it's very hard, how are we gonna learn this? These are my two summer high school students, uh, Deep Dee and Mary Catherine, okay? They are working on entanglement distribution and quantum networks for quantum internet, and the program, one is programming in Python, the other one is in Mathematica. They, we started with this paper, and they're gonna be on the next paper. She's going to Princeton in the fall, okay? So the idea is, is that you take this entanglement, okay? This is a breakthrough in communications, and you distribute it. So you have these little nodes here, and sitting each of these nodes is this atom or the source of entangled photons, and it's just spewing them out, right? Entangled photons are going here, entangled photons are going there. And the idea is that at the end of the day, all of the nodes on the edge share entanglement with all of the other nodes. Now, you, let's suppose these are sent <coughs> over fibers. Now, Bad guy comes in, cuts all the fibers. Maybe even cuts all the nodes in the middle, blows them all up. As long as these remain entangled with these, and they have another means to communicate other than fiber, smoke signals, they can still communicate even though there's nothing in the middle and they're just sending four bits of information at a time. So this allows you to communicate with nothing being there. So, uh, it's a breakthrough in the way that you would want to think about this. And once you have shared entanglement, 
You can dis you do distributed quantum computing. The quantum computers now are very small. Maybe rather than make one big one, we have 20 of them located in different places around Munich, and we hook them up over this thing, and then we do the con uh, distributed quantum computing. This is a secure cryptographic scheme. We can use this for the entangled clocks, the entangled sensors, and everything else. So imagine an, an internet that doesn't actually have wires or fibers connecting anything to anything. Just smoke signals and entanglement. It's, in some sense, you put the communication in the front end. And so if a bad guy takes out all of the middle, as long as you've got good entanglement, you're fine. Okay? And we're looking at different graph structures. So it's back to the old, uh, when does the internet fail? How many nodes and links do you have to take out? But if there are no nodes and links, what does that question even mean? One of the things that we're missing, though, so this is another form of, of quantum key distribution in cryptography. This is called the Eckert protocol. It uses entangled particles. It also gives you shared random numbers for a one-time pad. It's also unbreakable, and, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, you can test for an eavesdropper by checking to make sure quantum mechanics is right and Einstein's theory is wrong. You put two of these guys together, okay, and you put a quantum measuring device here. This is similar to the experiment that we saw before. This is gone, and then this and this are entangled, even though they never talk to each other. So you can this is how you distribute entanglement through the network. Okay, missing piece is all of the pieces to do this quantum measurement are in place in China and, and Australia and uh, other places. But what's missing is a quantum memory. There needs to be a quantum memory that holds this information for a certain amount of time. So this is called a quantum repeater. In classical internet, you have little erbium doped fibers that are amplifiers. When the signal gets weak, you amplify them. It's like a laser amplifier. You cannot amplify quantum states because that's equivalent to making copies of them. And I just told you you can't copy quantum states without destroying them. So amplifiers can't be used. We have to make a quantum repeater, which is basically a small, special purpose, all optical quantum computer that does one thing over and over again. And if you don't have that, then you have to go to the satellites, because without, without this, you can't do it over land. So you know, the Chinese program, since there are no quantum repeaters, they invested in satellite communication, where they do the link up via the satellite, and the satellite is assumed secure. So if I was going to invest money, I would put into quantum repeaters because when that comes online, that's a complete game changer. All right, that's it. And I want to thank Dr. Krishmar for advertising in my book, but I'm advertising <laughs> even in bigger font. And this is from Amazon.com. This is my favorite. Realistically exciting and frightening. <laughs> so any case. This is, this is, I drew my own artwork in PowerPoint. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. This record.